what I'm going to do is uh, walk you through um, an assessment of uh, some of the things that I believe we've learned from uh, philosophy and cognitive science over the last few years, which help us to understand the basis of our own human irrationality a little better. Uh, I want to try to explain why that makes us vulnerable to fake news and propaganda and alternative facts. And uh, in effect, I'm doing that for a purpose. I want to try to uh, create for you an opportunity or a framework which would allow you to think a little bit more critically about scientific issues that affect uh, your daily lives. Of course, we are doing this entire festival virtually because we are following scientific principles that are affecting our daily lives. Uh, and to a certain extent, we can see how fundamentally important that is. Uh, but also, which gives you an opportunity, in fact, to, to come to terms with some of the complexities that we're dealing with. And I thought we'd launch by one of my favorite quotes from Einstein, time and again, the passion for understanding has led to the illusion that man is able to comprehend the objective world rationally by pure thought, without any empirical foundations, in short, by metaphysics. I hope that by the time we're done, you'll understand where uh, that statement is coming from and where Einstein uh, has developed these sentiments. Um, we live in an extraordinary complex world, uh, so complex, in fact, that I would deny uh, any individual human mind can hope to fathom it. Um, as humans, we've invented extraordinary social structures to help us live our lives, earn a living look after us when we're ill, um, take care of our money, our finances. Um, a lot of these structures depend on modern science and technology, and whether we like it or not, scientific and technological issues pervade uh, almost our very existence. But most of us don't have the depth of experience or the expertise to sit in instant judgment on scientific issues. And, and honestly, that goes for everyone. I trained as a scientist, although I gave up academic science many years ago. But you ask me about the coronavirus pandemic, and I have to tell you that that's not an area of science in which I have any familiarity. I don't have the depth of experience or the expertise to judge whether advice that I'm getting from the government, for example, is the right advice or the wrong advice. We also live in extraordinary times. Uh, we've become familiar with the notion of, of post-truth. Casual lies, fake news, and alternative facts uh, appear to be with us literally every day, uh, everywhere we look, whether it's on social media, newspapers, news broadcasts. Um, and, and what this means is that we can be very easily misled to a conclusion that is demonstrably false. And that's, a, that's obviously a problem. This talk will provide hopefully some background knowledge and a framework that will help you think more critically about scientific issues. And I want to begin really by going back to um, some, some structures developed from philosophy that help us think about the complexities of social reality, so the reality of our lived experience. And I want to distinguish that very clearly from natural reality or physical reality, the natural world. We know it's constructed from particles and forces it consists of objects such as atoms, mountains, lakes, trees, and living things. Um, what I mean is these are the brute facts which we assume if we could imagine a scenario whereby all of humanity disappeared overnight. Planet Earth was left free of, um, if you want to think about it as contamination by human beings, um, the brute facts, I would argue, we would quite happily presume would still exist, even though we didn't. So there would still be atoms, there would still be mountains, trees, lakes, and living things. Um, but there are also what the American philosopher John Searle calls institutional facts. Uh, these are undeniably real. Um, a good example is money, <laughs> which, let's say, um, is an obsession of all of us from time to time. Uh, but money is an institutional fact which exists only within a structure of constitutive rules. Um, they're printed by recognized national banks. Um, they have a certain uh, combination of inks and colors and notations. 
Um, but these have been invented by by us. Um, they, they, if we were to cease to exist overnight, um, these notes, these dollar bills would continue to exist, but money would have no meaning because without human minds, there is no meaning for this stuff. And it's a point that John Searle explains in his book, The Construction of Social Reality, that institutional facts exist only in our minds. Now, there's philosophers who would argue that even the brute facts are, are really based on our perception. Anyone who's watched a movie called The Matrix from the late 90s will know what these philosophers are saying. Uh, but the simple truth is that it makes no logical sense to claim that these brute facts stop existing when we're not looking at them or thinking about them. But certainly uh, institutional facts, if humanity were to cease to exist, uh, then there is a sense in which these facts cease to exist as well. I, I wear a wedding ring. It's an example of taking um, a, an aspect of physical reality, the precious metal in this case, making it into a band. But of course, it means a lot more than simply a band of metal. It carries all sorts of connotations in terms of what's expected of me as a husband um, in, in, a, in a marriage. And, and that's an institutional fact. Uh, marriage doesn't exist without human beings. The metal will continue to exist. Now, this is fascinating, but we should accept that social reality is effectively weightless and invisible. Um, John Searle wrote that one reason we bear the burden is that the complex structure of social reality is, to, is so to speak, weightless and invisible. We grow up as children in a culture where um, we take social reality for granted. Um, we learn to perceive and use socially created things like cars and bathtubs and houses, money, restaurants and schools without thinking of them as any different from trees and lakes and rivers and atoms. Uh, we don't recognize the special features of their ontology, their basis in knowledge and without their, about being aware that they have a, a special, uh, a special at nature in the sense of belonging to our social reality. They seem as natural to us as stones and water and trees. So this is quite extraordinary. So we've created these structures. They're already very, very complex. Um, we take them for granted. They're weightless and invisible. And yet it actually gets worse. That is, in a sense, already bad enough. Um, but now add it to some of the findings recently from cognitive science, uh, one of which is the conclusion that we have a tendency as human beings to think we know more than we really do. Uh, when faced with asking, being asked to self-assess our knowledge of, of, of something, like the operation of a flush toilet, just to pick a mundane example, uh, we have a tendency to rate ourselves quite highly. When we then ask to provide an explanation, well, how does a flush toilet work? We say, well, we push the handle here and water goes down there. And we start to lose a little bit of that confidence. If we're given a diagnostic question to answer, our confidence diminishes a little more. Um, if we're then presented with an expert explanation of how a flush toilet works, we're initially uh, concerned that we really didn't understand it to begin with, but of course, once we've understood the expert explanation, our confidence increases again. Uh, but there's no doubt that this initial assessment of our own ability to understand facets of our social reality um, is what cognitive scientists call the illusion of explanatory depth. We think we know more than we really do. And uh, social reality is so complex that that's potentially dangerous uh, situation. Um, the basis, I'm going to give you a series of books. I've already given you John Searle. Check out this book by Stephen Sloman and Philip Fernback as well called The Knowledge Illusion. And they say there that our success as a species is based on the collective intelligence and the ability to collaborate. So we don't need to know how a flush toilet works. We just use it but we know a plumber who does, uh, who can come and fix it when it goes wrong. It gets worse in another way. Basically what Kahneman says is that we have two modes of, of reasoning. Uh, one based on system one, which is intuitive, it's emotional, it's biased towards believing, it's a mechanism for jumping to conclusions, and it's what Kahneman calls thinking fast. We have another system, system two. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.